Patrick, welcome to Life on Thanks the Thanks a lot. Great to be here. And you have written a great book called To Raise the, to the Fallen, um, the story of Father Willie Doyle, uh, chaplain during the First World War. And uh, can you tell us, how did you come to know or find out about Father Willie Doyle? So a friend recommended that I read the original biography of Father mm -hmm. Doyle, written in the 1920s by his friend, Professor Alfred O'Reilly. And that was a blockbuster book. It was translated into all the major European languages. It ran through multiple editions. Um, and when I read the book, I was absolutely astounded at the heroism and the generosity of Father Doyle. I'm from a town that's about two miles away from where Father Doyle was born and grew up. Uh, and I'd never heard about mm -hmm. him. And I had two emotions uh, about this. I had an amazement that I never heard about somebody who was so uh, heroic and generous, but also a certain frustration that his memory had been allowed to recede in the last few decades. Um, so I hope that the book and programs like this can uh, bring his memory alive again and, and let people know and learn about this fascinating man. Whenever I was reading the book, you read his letters during the war, and it goes into a lot of detail. It's pretty gruesome at times. But while you're reading it, he always remains very calm mm -hmm. uh, and very at peace. He has this, just this remarkable confidence and trust in God. But we find out earlier in his life, he had a nervous breakdown. Can you speak about that? That's right. So uh, at around the age of 20, the building he was in as a Jesuit student went on fire. And that had a big impact on him. Um, he had to leave the Jesuits for a little while. We're, we're told he had something of a, of a nervous breakdown. He had to go home and recuperate. And it was unusual for somebody like that to be allowed to return to the Jesuits because there were many priests and many vocations at the time and people who had struggles like that weren't always accepted back. And I'm told by Jesuits that it's almost a once in a generation event that somebody would be allowed to return after uh, a health situation of, of that nature. But his story is fascinating because it's one of transformation, because we see somebody who had this um, mental health challenge because of the fire, who overcame it with his mm -hmm. own efforts, but also with the grace of God, and was transformed to the point where 20 years later, he was a rock of courage and strength. And as you say, a very, very serene man in the midst of some of the most awful scenes oh, of the war, uh, to the point where soldiers would flock to him yeah. to get support and courage uh, because he had this aura and peace and yeah. serenity about him. And just reading about him, you get a very deep sense that he's very oriented to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And we read even as a child, whenever he kind of first learned this, he first got this shilling and he wanted to go buy candy at a candy store. But he came across a beggar who needed food. And there was this dilemma between grace and nature. Mm -hmm. Do I give the shilling to this man or do I go spoil it on myself? But he gave it to the beggar. Mm -hmm. And he said he was, it, it shook him up. It, it hurt him, but it was kind of that first approach to sacrifice. And that carried out throughout his life. Can you talk about the sacrifice? Yeah, life? so sacrifice, I mean, anyone who's in a war or a yeah. chaplain in a war knows what sacrifice means in a way that many of us in the first world today don't necessarily right. uh, because they lived a tough life. But Father Doyle was prepared for the sacrifices of war because of the sacrifices that he made throughout his life. Mm -hmm. So as a boy, as you said, as quite a young boy, he gave that shilling away and it was tough for him. Um, and as he grew up and developed as a Jesuit student and then later on as a priest, um, he made many, many sacrifices, mm -hmm. some of them very simple. Um, for instance, one resolution he had was not to take butter on his bread at yes. breakfast. Now, if you're not Irish, that may not seem like a big sacrifice, but if you're Irish, you love your butter. And what's fascinating is you see he records in his diary his real struggles with this. Yeah. You know, really tempted to take butter. I, I struggled. It's, it's tough. Uh, but at the same time, he also did really heroic sacrifices yeah. in terms of uh, quite quite tough penances. And one of those sacrifices, I just remember reading it and it just struck me, is that he was working with like a doctor, a chaplain there in the trenches, and this guy was sick, and it's just cold, it's wet, wet and it's damp, and as a sacrifice, he offered to sleep on his stomach so mm -hmm. this doctor could sleep on his back so yeah. he could stage dry, yeah. and yeah. that to me it was just it, absolutely remarkable. Well, <laughs> I have the same reaction to that. You yeah. know, who, who wants somebody sleeping right. on your back when you're already in a tough situation in the trenches? Um, and that, to me, is an incredible act of charity and oh, sacrifice, absolutely. which you cannot actually achieve or do without having trained yourself with smaller sacrifices along the way. And we see in Father Doyle, by the time he gets to the war, uh, and even during his years in the war, the two years he spent as a military chaplain, uh, an ongoing self-emptying where, right. he's, where he's saying no to himself and letting God's grace fill him 
even more so that he can achieve even more and, and, and be more generous with and others. I think that's an interesting quality about him because he is an extraordinary man of sacrifice. But you also see at the same time he did struggle, mm -hmm. you know, and he even writes in his diaries that the sacrifice of like giving up the bread mm -hmm. or the butter, yes. you know, it was like out of fear he just didn't want to do it. But he knew deep in his heart that God was yeah. always calling him yeah. Yeah. to sacrifice more yeah. and more. And we see that throughout yeah. his life. I mean, he, he felt he had a call to a particularly hard life. Yes. Um, you know, even to the point where he would say, not just a hard life that an average priest or religious or Jesuit had at the time, which, you know, was quite a sacrificial and, and tough life. He really discerned uh, and he spoke to others about it. He got approval from his confessor and from other uh, superiors that he was called to an even greater heroism mm -hmm. and an even greater sacrifice. And interestingly, much of that was oriented around reparation for the sins of priests. And he felt yes, called yeah. to offer himself, um, offer himself really as a victim in reparation for those sins. And the very last thing he wrote in his private diary, on the 10th anniversary of his ordination, and just three weeks before he died, was that he offered up all his sufferings in the trenches to make yeah. up for the sins of other priests. Wow. And even with these sacrifices, we also see that he really kept a written record of how he spiritually grew in that mm -hmm. area. Can you just speak about that real quick? Yes, yeah, so uh, we have a lot of his letters from the war, which were sent to his family. Uh, but back in his room in Dublin were private writings that were never meant to be seen by anybody else. And his older brother was also a Jesuit. Yeah. And when he was cleaning out his room back in Dublin, after he had died, he found these boxes of private notes with a note saying, please destroy in case of death. Um, but he brought them to his superior and he agreed that they shouldn't be destroyed because they were very valuable and edifying. And what you see here is, as another biographer described it, a very rare sight, which is sanctity in the making, mm -hmm. the painstaking efforts that somebody makes to uh, empty themselves so that God's grace can fill them. So it's not just a, a self-will to be holy, right. but a self-will to say no to myself so that I can say yes to God. Um, and, you know, many Jesuits of the time kept private notes, but his are particularly detailed. He would keep records of his successes in terms of the sacrifices and the ways he was able to deny himself, but also of his failures so that he could learn from them and improve for the next day. So he was constantly trying to improve. And he said two weapons anyone should have in the spiritual life are a lead pencil and a piece of paper. Okay. Because if you keep a record of what you're doing, then you can improve and try and build upon it going forward. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Patrick. And now we go to a break. And Patrick, one of the things I loved about this book, while I'm reading in the life of Father Willie Doyle, is that he's somebody that really pricks the conscience. Because it's so easy for us to just become very complacent mm -hmm. in our life, or negligent, or sloppy, or whatever. But he had a really good quote in here that says, to do something great and heroic may never come, but I can make my life heroic by faithfully and daily putting my best effort to each duty as it comes around. And he really embodied that, not only, you know, as a chaplain in the, in the monastery and out in the world, but mm -hmm. even on the battlefield. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So, I mean, one of the key parts of his spirituality was doing ordinary things and doing them extraordinarily yes. well and putting great love for God into it. And we can see a similarity here between uh, Father Willie and other saints. Yeah. Um, St. Therese obviously yes. comes to mind in her little way. They were both born in the same year. He had a devotion to her. Um, so this may have influenced his, his thinking. Um, but also St. Jose Maria Escriva, mm -hmm. who read the uh, original biography of Father Doyle in Spanish um, and also wrote about him. We can see that same type of spirituality in the life of St. Jose Maria. But this is what he always advised others. You know, even though he himself did very heroic things, he didn't advocate that for others. He said, do your job well. Okay, if some opportunity comes around to be heroic, do it. But the reality is, as Jesus tells us, you know, he who is faithful in little things will be the one who is faithful in great things. We can't expect to be faithful in great moments of crisis or trauma if we haven't trained ourselves by being faithful yes. in little things as we go along. I think his, even his fasting... Because I just remember reading, it was like he didn't want to fast, and the excuse was like, well, I'm going to become weak. Mm -hmm. But there you read, like, one day, I mean, all he had was just a cup of tea on a day where they had to march 15 Correct. miles. Yes. And it's like, man, that's so humanly impossible. Yes. <laughs> with God. Yes. I mean, all things are possible. So. He, well, he says again and again in his notes, you know, I really felt like sleeping in. I really felt yes. like indulging myself and taking comfort. But I said no, and I, I made a sacrifice. And 
what I learn now is I'm more vigorous and I'm more energetic when I make the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to assume that some level that's the grace of God working in him. Maybe it's also physiological as well, but God's grace is certainly there when we empty ourselves and allow God to come into our life. prayer life, I mean, he would spend nights up all night just praying and then soldiers would come in and ask to hear confession yeah. or he'd be called up, but he was always really praying Correct. The, out there in the battlefield. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he, any of us in a war situation might want to get our sleep at night, you right. know, but there were many nights. I mean, certainly wouldn't pretend it was every night. I mean, he, he needed sleep like everyone, but there were nights, entire nights, where he would pray all mm -hmm. night long. And you say five minutes more. Yeah. Just five yeah. minutes more. And in fact, that's yeah. one of the things when it came to his sacrifices, you know, we shouldn't think about all the sacrifices we have to do in all of our life. We think about it's the sacrifice of this moment. Right. So when I'm tired, it's just five minutes more. And then when those five minutes are up, that's another five minutes. Yes. And by doing that, he was able to stay praying all night long. And he did live very much in the present moment. Because mm -hmm. he said we can all always have these great ambitions and desire, and desire spiritually. But whenever, whenever it's asked of us in the now, mm -hmm. you know, he was very much about doing it in the now. Yeah. You know? I mean, he was a realist. I mean, was. and that's part of a Jesuit spirituality. Um, you know, yesterday is gone and it's over. Uh, we've either gotten the merit from yesterday or, or not. Tomorrow may never come. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is either in the memory or the imagination apart from right now. And yes. It's the present moment that we have to live. And he had a very keen sense of the shortness of life. Mm -hmm. And he realized that maybe just going into the war, but it made him very vigorous in his priesthood and ministry out there and he was fearless. Mm -hmm. But you can even take that principle and just apply it to our own daily life. Yeah. Of how we should always kind of keep that in mind. Mm -hmm that God and eternity mm -hmm. are real and that yeah. at any given moment, it can be our time. I mean, he, he, had a, he had a sense that, um, which is true, that we all have to render an account of our mm -hmm. lives and we don't know when we're going to have to render that account. And that certainly made him vigorous and made him very zealous. One of the moving, and I know it struck me, but can you talk about whenever he was there, the mass of the dead? And what that was like for Yeah, him. so I'll, I'll read this excerpt from a letter that he wrote home to his father. And it was during the Battle of the Somme, which is one of the horrendous battles of, of the First World War, incredible sights and sufferings. And uh, he's describing a mass that he offered in the trenches on that occasion. And he says, by cutting a piece out of the side of the trench, I was just able to stand in front of my tiny altar, a biscuit box supported on two German bayonets. God's angels, no doubt, were hovering overhead, but so were the shells, hundreds of them. And I was a little afraid that when the earth shook with the crash of the guns, the chalice might be overturned. Round about me on every side was the biggest congregation I ever had. Behind the altar, on either side and in front, row after row, sometimes crowding one upon the other, but all quiet and silent, as if they were straining their ears to catch every syllable of that tremendous act of sacrifice. But every man was dead. Mm. Some had lain there for a week and were foul and horrible to look at with faces black and green. Others had only just fallen and seemed rather sleeping than dead. But there they lay, for none had time to bury them." Wow. So an incredible and uh, moving and scene. He had seen a lot and he had been through a lot. Father Willie Doyle was a remarkable man and I wish we had more time to talk about him. And Patrick, thank you for coming on this thank show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate Delighted. It.